right. Well, if you have your Bible, go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As you do celebrate Memorial Day, and thank you, Ray, for, for praying for the families, loved ones of those who have fallen, but also bringing it back to Jesus, and um, just a lot of powerful things today. I just wanna, just briefly, if you have, Memorial Day is about remembering those who have fallen. It's not about our veterans, it's Veterans Day. It's not celebrating God for our nation, that's 4th of July. Today is about those soldiers who have fallen. And so if you have a family member, loved one, or a good friend that died in service, would you just stand up so we can just wanna acknowledge your, what you've been through? Amen. Thank you for your perseverance and your, your grace. Today is also in the church calendar. Today is the day of Pentecost. 50th day after the Passover. Pentecost means 50th, right? And so it's the 50th day after the Passover when they would have the first sampling of their first crops of the year. Anybody already have any, any crops already in a garden? Maybe it's a little bit, right? Okay, it's not harvest time, but you might get the first sampling. That's, that's Pentecost. But also we know Acts chapter two, it was a day of Pentecost during the Feast of Pentecost when God sent the Holy Spirit in the first sampling of the believers, right, and started the church. So not only is this Memorial Day for our soldiers, but it's also, it's the birthday of the church. Praise God for that, right? Happy birthday, church. Yeah, uh, don't do the math real quick. You're probably almost 2,000 years old, probably 1,990-ish years old. Well, pretty old. <laughs> All right, that's good. But 1 Corinthians 11, what we're doing today, it's very appropriate looking at memorial. They were talking about the Lord's Supper, right? So if you look at the, the New Testament, um, Jesus, you know, he, he lived his life. He was God in the flesh. He lived sinless life, and he voluntarily took his sinless life, and he went to the cross to be the sacrifice in our place, to die in our place, to die the death that you and I deserve, where his body was broken and his blood was shed for you and for me. And like Ray prayed, he died, but then he rose from the grave. He's alive and we celebrate that. Well, Jesus commands us to do two things that's a way to, to honor, to remember, to participate with him in that. And we, we're celebrating both of those today. We already did baptism with Jacob, and that was awesome, amen. It's always awesome to celebrate baptism. And then we're also celebrating the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments. So um, hopefully you got one of these little packets. If you did not get a packet uh, in a little while, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and one of our deacons or ushers will get that. If you're watching from home, you've got a few moments to, uh, to get your, elements together, some, some grape juice and a cracker, that sort of thing, would be good. Um, so he gave us these two things. We call them ordinances. Now, you don't find that word in the Bible. You don't find the word ordinance in the Bible. Some traditions call them sacraments. How many of you have heard that word before? The sacrament. If you grew up Catholic, you would have heard that word. We intentionally do not use the word sacrament because that word is defined as a means of grace. That's what the word sacrament means, means of grace. Well, we don't receive extra grace from God as we take the Lord's Supper. Our grace from God comes through faith and faith alone. Amen. It's a radical distinction. We're going to unpack that today. We're going to look at this because the first Corinthians, the Corinthian church, right? We talked about before. They 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 had a lot of problems. You know, they had a lot of issues. We looked at a lot of these. They were divided. Um, they were sexually impure. Um, they had favorites. They had class division, wealth divisions, um, age division. There were just so much, so many problems and divisions in the church. And there always will be diversity in the church, right? Uh, here in, in Canaan, we have diversity of age. You know, we just celebrated, I think it was last Saturday, went to Miss Gladys Winkle's 100th birthday party. Is that not awesome? It's amazing, right? And then, it was it Mother's Day two Sundays ago, we celebrated all the babies that have been born, right? And so it's exciting to see that kind of age diversity in our congregation. So praise God for that, amen? That is healthy. That is a healthy church to have that kind of age diversity. We also have diversity in you know, backgrounds, diversity in maybe upbringings, diversity in, um, in preferences, diversity in even some racial diversity. You know, we, we have all these different kind of diversities and those are healthy. But Jesus' vision for the church has never been uniformity, but it's always been unity, right? 
unity among diversity. So for the Corinthian church, and really the church as a whole, the one place above any other place where we should have that unity on display is when we come together around the Lord's table and take the Lord's supper. So a lot of was going on in uh, the, the church at Corinth. Um, they had, you know, back in those days, they didn't have church buildings. So churches would gather in a home and usually it's a wealthy person's home because they're the ones that could afford a home big enough to host uh, the number of people in the church. And so, you know, you had, you had class divisions, you had wealth division, that sort of thing. So on a Sunday, most of the wealthy did not have to work. So they'd come over early and the host who hosted the church usually have a meal, they called breaking bread together. And the meal would be a full meal, but it also would include the Lord's Supper toward the end. And then the poor folks who did have to work a little bit on Sunday or whatever, they would come in as they could. But then what would happen, you would have the wealthy would already have eaten and they would have eaten most of the food, right? And then they would all gather in a room. But then you have the poor people come in later, wouldn't be much left, but they had to go sit in another room because the other room's full. So you almost had like two campuses in one, in one location, right? It's kind of what you had, we put in today's vernacular. Well, that was creating division and it, it. They lacked the unity and the togetherness that was supposed to be at the Lord's Supper. And, and Paul's kind of like, man, this is, this is ridiculous. I've, I've had it. I've got to deal with this. And so he writes this portion of 1 Corinthians 11 to set them straight because they were totally missing the mark on what the Lord's Supper was all about. So we're gonna read, start, we're gonna actually cover the rest of chapter 11 today, starting verse 17, but just to start us off, we're gonna read verse 17 through 22. So please stand and honor the reading of God's word. He's gonna fuss at them a little bit. Verse 17. In the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but it's for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. He's fussing, isn't he? Wow, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for just the the honesty of your scriptures and the clarity of your scriptures. God, I pray that you would clearly speak to us today about the Lord's Supper, the, the depths and the riches of what it means to partake in you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we just commend this time to you. Use it for your purpose and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Go ahead and be seated. So, Paul addresses this problem out of his theology of communion or the Lord's Supper. If you grew up Catholic, sometimes they call it the Eucharist, which is fine because the Greek word Eucharisto means I give thanks. And so it's a way to give thanks, to honor Jesus. <clears throat> but he lays out his theology about the Lord's Supper, which is huge. And so this, um, it's one re- kind of four big words today. We're gonna look at four key words. These are the four points. Remember, proclaim, partake, and examine. That's what we're looking at today, about the Lord's Supper. Remember. And so number one in your notes, and I don't, I don't have the, I don't, my, my, I'm not connected there, Maggie. Great job, awesome. So the big thought is this, worshiping the Lord in the Lord's Supper really constitutes kind of a, a high point of the sweetness of the fellowship we have with their Lord and with each other, right? It's, it's a high point. So we're gonna look at that. We're gonna kind of unpack that today. So we look at number one in your notes, remember. So go on, so, so Paul lays out the trouble, right? There are all these divisions. There are, some are the poor going hungry, the rich are getting full, <coughs> eating all the food. There's this separation, there's this divisions in the Lord's Supper based on class, based on wealth, et cetera, and it should not be this way. If there's ever a moment in the life of the church where we're unified, it's at the Lord's table. So remember, he goes on, verse 23. It says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, I also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To remember. So here he really tells us to remember four things. First, we're to remember his body. So here in a few moments, when we take the Lord's Supper, and you take your packet, you, not, don't do it now, but you take your packet and you pull out the, the styrofoam <laughs> wafer. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. <clears throat> anyway, you take out the wafer, right? Here the wafer, it represents the body of Jesus. Just think about his body. What did Jesus' body go through for us? Well, he was taken after his trial to the area where they would tie him up to a post and they scourged him, they whipped him. 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. Cat of nine tails was a whip that had the, the handle and then nine leather straps or tails. And then fixed into those, tied into those straps would have been little rocks and little pieces of bone. So it did damage to the body when they whipped him. He endured that, 39 lashes. That wasn't it. Then his body, they took him, untied him, and they took the tibium, which is the cross beam of the cross. They made it, put him on his shoulders and forced him and his tired, human, beaten body to carry that from the place of scourging down the Via Dolorosa, which means the, the way of tears, to Golgotha, place of the skull, Calvary, the hill where he would be crucified. <coughs> According to the gospels, of course, he couldn't make it. His body was just too broken. So the Roman soldiers forced this man named Simon of the Cyrenia to carry the tibium for Jesus. Simon's two sons were there, Alexander and Rufus. What a, what a powerful moment for you as little boys to see your dad have the opportunity to carry the cross of Jesus. And tradition says both Alexander and Rufus would go on and be believers later on. What a, what a, what a powerful memory. See their dad carry the tibium for Jesus whose body was broken and beaten for them, for us, for you, for me. And of course, Jesus has to finish walking up the hill to Calvary. And if you've ever tried to climb a steep hill when you're, you're just whooped, it's hard. And he was way more whooped than we've ever been. Climbed up there, gets to the top. And there they take the tibium, they lay it across the vertical beam. They force Jesus to lay down. They stretch his arms, probably pulling them out of socket. <coughs> so his body's broken. Or they drive the spikes, most likely in his wrists. Of course, your hands go paralyzed, give you the claw effect, would have the appearance of the nails would be in the hands, but probably in the wrist, so they would hook on the ulna and the radius. And they drove the spike into his feet. And then they raised him up for all to see the broken body. To remember the body. Also, to remember his blood. Don't really know exactly how many pints of blood he had. I think the average human has, what, 10 pints, 12 pints of blood in the body. We know that when he had died, to check, the Roman soldier grabbed a spear and thrust it into his side. Water came out, no blood. The bleeding would have probably begun when they took this crown of thorns, placed it on his head, and we assume they didn't place it on his head very gently. They rammed it down, forced it in place. Of course, around the skull is the most sensitive part of your body. So many nerve endings. This would have been a very painful moment as the blood would just excrete from his head, drip down his face, his back, his shoulders. And then the 39 lashes. I mean, it's a 
horrific to even think about what that would have looked like and how much blood he would have spilt. Then the journey should not have been called the Via Dolorosa, it should have been called the way of blood because I'm sure it was a bloody trail that led from the place of scourging to Golgotha. And then he drove the spikes, more blood. And they didn't sear it to seal the wounds. It would continue to have bled and all of the motion, the pulling, gravity doing his thing and trying to stand up so he could breathe and slink back down. That process would have continued to aggravate the wound, creating more blood and more blood. A lot of blood. He says, this is my blood that I shed for you. Remember the blood. Third, this isn't specified, but it's definitely implied. Remember the love. Remember how much he loves us. From the cross, as his body is broken, as he is pouring out his blood, Jesus says seven different things from the cross. There's seven statements that Jesus utters from the cross. We did a whole series on this back in 2020, and I know y'all remember every bit of that. But, but we did a series on the seven sayings from the cross, and they're all filled with love and purpose and intentionality. Like Jesus from the cross, there he is in agony and excruciating pain. Let me just tell you, you know, I, I, I've been pretty sick coming back from India because I, I think I brought a buddy back with me, you know what I mean? And, um, and you, when you're sick, and guys, you can totally echo this, right? When you're sick, it, it's all about you, right? I mean, come on. I mean, you want, you know, I love my wife to bring me something to drink and you know, I, want, I want to be taken care of. I want to be mamaed when I'm sick, right? Come on, give me an amen, guys. Thanks, don't leave me hanging, thank you. Yeah, but, but Jesus, in exponentially more excruciation, he is loving. He looks out as the oldest son of Mary. It's his job to make sure she's taken care of. So from the cross and his agony and his suffering, he thinks about mama. He looks out at Jesus, I mean at John, he says, son, behold your mother, talking about Mary. He looks at his mom, mother, behold your son. What was he doing? He was delegating that responsibility. He was taking care of mama. He also says famously, father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. And this to people who are walking by and spitting on him. Walking by and mocking him, saying, oh, yeah, king of the Jews, right. Yeah, if you're the Messiah, buddy, once you get down from the cross yourself, oh, then we might believe. Father, forgive them. You know, I, I would be tempted, I'm sure, if I had that kind of power to show them up. Say, All right, watch this, buddy, you know, <laughs> right? No, Jesus, that's right, thank you, brother. Jesus loved and out of his love for them, he knew he had to complete his mission. He knew he had to die. Love. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love gives. Jesus gave his life because he loved. And then, we see verse 26. Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I think the fourth remember, remember his promise to return, amen? I mean, the cross is horrifically sad, it's devastating. The resurrection is glorious and victorious, but there's still more. Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, filling us with the very person of Jesus, empowering us to live for him, to obey him, to honor him, to have victory over sin, all of these, to boldly share the gospel. But even there still, there's more to come. Folks, it's not finished yet, all right? I mean, the penalty for our sin, that's been paid in full. Something else Jesus said, it is finished, paid in full. Yes, that's paid in full, that is finished. But Jesus' kingdom is still going and, and conquering and expanding, and Jesus is going to return. And this is such a powerful truth because in this world, we know that there's hardship, right? We read in this text here, in the context, there's the, there's the poor. 
But the Lord's table, the Lord's supper proclaims that death is not the end. Poverty is not the end. Jesus rose and he will return. The gospel says to the poor, you're not gonna be poor forever. Isn't that good news? Jesus will return and he will triumph and will feast the marriage supper of the lamb. To the sick, the gospel says, you're not gonna be sick forever. You'll suffer maybe a little while, but then the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. You know, this week I visited several of our really sick folks. You know, we have Beth Catherine, she's back home now, but she was in a hospital for about eight days. She's battling cancer. And visited Paul Kirby yesterday in his house. He's on hospice with cancer. You just see this, you know, as, as a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, or just friends and loved ones. I mean, you see a loved one sick, it just hurts, it's hard, and especially something really long and drawn out like cancer. It's brutal. But the gospel says, you'll not be sick forever. This is only last just a little while, but glory is forever because Jesus is coming back. Amen? Remember that. Remember that as you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, if you're in a season where you're separated from your loved ones who are followers of Jesus because of this horrible thing called death, remember as you partake of the Lord's Supper, it's only for a season. There's grand reunions that are gonna happen. And in the grand scheme of things, you're gonna happen soon and very soon, right? Like the song goes, right? Because he is coming back. And in Christ, we raised in him Forever. The gospel says to the oppressed, you won't be oppressed forever. The righteous judge will return and make all things right to the lonely, to the abandoned. The gospel says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I've gone to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back to take you home to be with me forever. With. With is a powerful preposition for the lonely. With someone else who loves you, who cares for you, who you love and care for. So the Lord's table proclaims that hardship, like Jesus' cross, is part of bringing God's plan into the world. So don't look down on the poor. They're not poor because they deserved it. Jesus was poor, and that was all part of God's plan. So remember the body, the blood, the love, and the return. Of Jesus. Secondly, proclaim. Verse 26, again, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim. The word proclaim means to preach, to herald, to declare, right? When you are taking an iron, when we are taking the Lord's Supper, we are preaching a sermon as we take the Lord's Supper. What are we preaching? Well, first, we preach number letter A, that we need to be saved, that there's a reason Jesus did this, that there's something that we cannot do on our own that God himself had to do for us to take care for us. We must be saved. The Bible says Romans 3, so many scriptures, right? Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 10, before that says, there is no unrighteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks God, none who understands. There is no one good, no, not one. That paints a bleak picture for us, right? Isaiah says, all of us, well, actually it's all we, which is probably better English, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. So here, Isaiah calls us sheep, which is not flattering, right? What do you know about sheep? Pretty dumb, They stink, they're helpless, and they just follow whatever, right? Yeah, that that describes us pretty well. We need to be saved. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, that you are dead in your transgressions. We're dead in their sin. We need to be saved. But number two, or letter B, you can be saved. Look what Jesus says here. You go back up. He says, this is my body, which is for who? You. Turn your neighbor and say, for you. Isn't that profound? It's for you. This is my body, broken for you. 
It's where it gets really personal. Jesus did this for you. It's, let that sink in. If you ever ask a question, well, nobody loves me. Now, you can't say that. Jesus let his body be broken. Let his body. He could have stopped at any time. He let his body be broken for you. You can be saved. Romans 10, Paul says, if you confess to your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you will be saved. Not hopefully, maybe, if it works out all right. No, you will be saved. Amen? Rescued, redeemed. Jesus says in John 3, it's called being born again. The dead comes to life. The spiritually dead comes to spiritual life. You're, you have faith. Your, your, soul, your heart is regenerated. You come into a living, vibrant relationship with the person of God through Jesus Christ. You're saved. You will live forever with God in glory. We're saved. You can be saved today. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He's written this whole book of 1 John. It's a letter. He writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I've written, these, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Did you know that we can know? Some conversations you may have with other groups, you know, you say, hey, do you, this is kind of a, a pretty good leading question to talking about the gospel. Say, hey, do you, how certain are you that if you died today, how certain are you that you would live with Jesus forever? or that God would let you in, whatever, right? I'm asking you that question. How certain are you today that if you were to die this afternoon, Lord forbid, but if you were to die today, how certain are you that you would be living with Jesus forever? How certain are you of that? To a lot of heads going, yeah, amen, that's good. Maybe you're here today or watching online, you're like, man, I don't, I don't know. I hope so. Well, I think we all hope so, right? But according to John and so many other scriptures, you can know so, right? And it's not because we're being arrogant. It's not because we're all of a sudden holier than thou. That has nothing to do with it. It's because according to the scriptures, according to the New Testament, according to Jesus' words, Paul's teachings, John's writings, according to what they teach us, Jesus already did all the work for us. Right, And when you place your faith, your trust in Christ and Christ alone for being saved, not part Christ, part your effort. When you put all of your trust on being saved in King Jesus, that's what it means when you confess Jesus as Lord. You are laying your whole life at his feet. You're saying, Jesus, it is all about you, right? We just baptized Jacob and I asked him, do you know you're gonna live and reign and follow Jesus forever? And he said, yes. Follow Jesus forever as Lord, as King. When you trust in Jesus, in Christ alone, that's when you are saved. That's when you are born again. But wait till we get good enough. We're never gonna get there. I mean, how many of us in here are good enough? Don't raise your hand. Don't embarrass yourself. Yeah. No, none of us, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, none who are good. No, not one. That includes me and you, right? So, Proclaim, proclaim that we can be saved because to come to the Lord's table is to be saved. You're already saved. It's for saved people. And third, proclaim that we're a family of the forgiven. We're not a, a bunch of holy rollers that got it all right. We're a bunch of messed up people forgiven by the grace of God and now filled with his spirit, able to do things for the glory of God because God's placed his presence within us through his spirit, right? So we're a, a gathering, we're a family of the forgiven. And we're all on equal footing. We're all sinners. So that leaves no room for religious pride. You know, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, it was during the Passover. The Passover celebrated way back in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, when God delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. And when they first, when they first experienced that first Passover, you know, they didn't have this class system. They were all slaves. There wasn't rich slaves and poor slaves, right? There wasn't, you know, this first class slave and this seventh class slave. They were all slaves. They were on equal footing and God saved how many of them? All of them, right? Equal footing. There's no place for 
for pride and religious pride to, to be there. We're equal footing. There's no room for socioeconomic arrogance. And I just got back from India, Nepal, and <clears throat> talking to Pastor Joshua, our Nepali pastor. I think he was on stage helping out with worship today. Um, talking to Pastor Joshua about the, the Nepali culture of church. You know, when you get outside of Kathmandu, which is the city, the big city in the capital, when you get like the more rural and other towns and villages and villages, uh, cities and villages, um, what happens is you see that those who are born again who become part of the church, they're immediately put in the lowest caste system. So it's all about caste, class, right? We see that here in, in this text. You had the rich people in one room. You had the poor people in the other room. We've seen it in our country's history. If you ever watched the movie Titanic or read about the Titanic, what class you were determined what deck level you were on, right? So if you were first class, you were on the upper deck. You had the humongous suites and bedrooms, right? If you were like seventh class, which was like Leonardo DiCaprio's character, you're down there, you're lucky you get a bunk bed. You're sleeping with the rats and all that fun stuff, right? It was a class system. Interesting, a few days after Titanic sank, New York Times ran an article and it listed every person's name on the Titanic in Two columns, lost, rescue. It didn't say what class they were. It didn't say first class or fifth class. Lost, rescue. Folks, eternal, eternally, that's the only classes there are. There's the lost and there's the rescue. We proclaim that as we partake. No room. No room for any such divisions. No room for racism. At our most fundamental level, we are humans. We are image bearers of Jesus, regardless of our color of our skin, right? Men and women made in the image of God, and we all have the same problem, the sin problem. We all have only one hope, the blood and the body of Jesus broken for us, who died and was resurrected in his gospel. That by itself should destroy racism, but it doesn't. Number three, partake. Partake. Verse 27 it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So it says, Let a person examine himself. We'll get to that. That the Lord's table. We participate, right, in the body of Christ. In fact, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looked at this a couple of weeks ago. It says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? It's just the Lord's table here. We, we participate in the body of Christ. Now, again, here in 1 Corinthians 11, technically the word participate is not in this text, but it's alluded to, and it is specified here in chapter 10. So, when you're taking the Lord's Supper, you're, you're literally touching something holy. We're, we're involved in a holy moment, the symbols of the death of his son. You know, participation, you're talking about fellowship, connecting with. So, there's really here, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, there's two ways that Christians kind of get off, get off the rails when it comes to the Lord's Supper and our participation of it. So this, I think this is in your notes, two ways Christians go wrong with understanding the Lord's Supper. The first is kind of the extreme one side. And if you were raised Catholic, how many, how many were raised Catholic in here? Yep. If you're raised Catholic, this is there, this is the Catholic teaching called transubstantiation. How many have heard that word before? Big word. So you see the word, you break the word down, trans, which means to change, right? Sub, su substantiation, you see the word substance, to change substance, right? So in the view of transubstantiation, which is the Roman Catholic view, they believe that as the priest blesses and elevates the elements, right? As, he, as he's reading the liturgy that the, the, the bread and the wine physically become the body and the blood of Christ. They change substances, right? So that's that view. This isn't in your notes, but to add another view that kind of is a little bit further this way from that. Transubstantiation is the extreme. Then you have a, the Lutheran view. Anybody grow up Lutheran? 
Raise your hand, raise your hand, yeah, no, okay. This is called consubstantiation, right? And what consubstantiation is, is that although it's not transubstantiation, the, the bread and the wine do not physically change and become the body and the blood of the Lord, but that as they're blessed and as the, the liturgy is read, that Christ's body becomes mingled in with the bread and that Christ's blood comes and becomes mingled in with the wine. So that as you take of these, you're literally taking in, right, the life of Christ. So the issue here is this, this leads us down a road of infusion. And this is kind of the view is that you receive, when you take the Lord's Supper, we take the Mass, the Eucharist, the communion, you are actually receiving the grace. You're receiving the life of Jesus Christ. But that's not what Scripture teaches us, right? Romans 10, 10 says, With a heart one believes and is justified. With a mouth one confesses and is saved. Your salvation is not dependent upon you getting more grace later down the road as you partake of, this, of the elements and continuation of masses. Righteousness didn't come to us by getting wet in the baptistry or by eating bread and drinking wine or juice. That's not how we get the righteousness of God. That's not how we receive salvation. That's not how we receive grace, which brings the question in, so how does righteousness come into your life? How do we get there? Well, the answer is simple. According to scriptures, by believing the word of God, by trusting in Christ and confessing him as Lord and Savior. So I think we have up on the screen, Maggie, if you go to the, uh, yeah, you got one more, keep going. Yeah, so how does righteousness come into our life? The next is the answer. The next slide. By believing the word of God. Trusting in Christ. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. This is how we are saved, by trusting in Jesus. Communion is not some kind of extra grace blessing. It goes beyond the righteousness of Christ which is already given to us. So whereas the, the Catholic view is more of infusion, right? You take the Lord's Supper, his grace is infused in you at that moment. Now we believe in a, another big I word called imputation. At the moment you're saved, his righteousness is imputed to you completely from here on out. So right now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've been saved, you are the righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ is in you. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean you go live any way you want to. No, because the righteousness of God is in you. If the righteousness of God is in you, he's gonna direct you, he's gonna lead you, he's gonna convict you to prevent you from doing the things that don't honor him, right? Now, we still fail, but still carry on the flesh, but, but communion is not this extra grace measure, right? No, when you trust it in Christ, you get the full righteousness of Christ, not a down payment that you supplement with communion or other sacraments down the road. You get it all. It's like, I hate to use the lottery as an example, but supposedly, right, which I've never played the lottery, but if you, if you, get a, if you win the lottery, you can like choose, I want, a, I, want a, I want it all up front, you get less, or I'll take it down the road, whatever, right? It's not like that at all. Right? When you come to faith in Christ, you get it all and you get it all immediately. Amen? Awesome. It's not payments. It's not an ongoing thing. The presence of God was given to you through faith. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. He says, let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Of course, the implied answer is hearing with faith. That was the answer. So it's like saying, did you receive the Spirit by taking communion or by hearing the gospel with faith? Yeah, heard the gospel with faith. His answer is, of course, by with faith. You receive the Spirit the same way you were given righteousness, which is by believing the gospel. You get all of Christ, all of the Spirit, when you trust in Jesus. So communion brings neither the righteousness of Christ or his presence into you. Both of these were given to you fully when you trusted Christ. So those two are kind of on that side. Then you have the extreme other side. Back to our two questions, two ways Christians go wrong. And that is seeing the Lord's Supper as just symbolic, right? So obviously, the Roman Catholic view, you have the Lutheran view, which is espoused by a guy named Martin Luther, right? This view, um, this purely symbolic view, was espoused by another reformer, same time as Martin Luther, big name, hard names, Ulrich Zwingli. Say that one three times fast. 
So Ulrich Zwingli came on the scene, if you read your church history, as a reformer, about the same time as Martin Luther. They were contemporaries, right? But Zwingli took a, a, an extreme opposite view of Roman Catholics and said, look, there's nothing super spiritual about it. It's just symbolic. It's just symbolic. Well, it kind of goes against what Paul says here. Paul says we are participating. And so that leaves this fourth guy, and it's kind of the view that we have, and that's a guy named John Calvin. Um, and he says, it's, yes, it is symbolic, right? But we are participating. We're experiencing the presence in a special way. His presence here in these moments is powerful. Of course, you'll say, but well, isn't Jesus always with us? And is he always with us? Absolutely, right? He's always here. He's always with us. But as we take the Lord's Supper, he manifests his presence in a special way. It kind of reminds me of my, my grandfather. Go to the next slide. I've got a picture here, I think. It's not a great picture. It's an old picture. I'm not in this picture. So that's my, that's my grandfather on the far left. I call him Pepal. Good Southern granddad term, right, Pepal? Pepal, as you can tell, was a pretty short man. He's five foot four. He didn't talk much. He's very quiet. He couldn't hear. He's almost deaf. And he had old school hearing aids, which really didn't work at all. Um, just a sweet fella. You know, and, and I'd go see my Pepal, and, and he, we, we didn't talk much because he couldn't hear, and I was a little kid at the time, and and now that I struggle hearing, small kids is really hard for, to hear for a person who struggles hearing because their frequency is higher, you know, all that stuff, right? So we didn't have a lot of conversations. You know, he'd always smile, he'd always hug me. He was super kind, super tender, just a, a good man. That's my dad to his left. That's my brother, and that's my nephew. Just to give you a reference, my nephew's 33 now, 34. Yeah, so anyway, it was a long, it was a long time ago. But anyway, but there was this one time I had with my papa. I actually don't have many pictures of my pet paws, the best one I could find. But I had this one moment with my pet paw. So one day we're staying at his house, lived in a farm in East Tennessee, up in the Smoky Mountains, right? And he had, a, had about 50 acres, he had cattle, he raised tobacco and all that sort of thing. And so he had, this, he had like three barns. And so we're walking up this steep hill toward one of his barns where he hung and cured tobacco. And he's, he just came in that morning and says, Daniel, you want to go with me? It's high, squeaky voice. Daniel, you want to go with me to the barn? I said, yeah, sure, Peppa. So we go, and we start having just a conversation. I don't know why he could hear me, but he could. And it was one of the few times in the life of my grandfather I had a really long, good conversation, right? At the end of that conversation, he gave me something. He gave me a little gift. He reached into his pocket, right? And he pulled out a silver pocket watch, now, we don't use pocket watches today, right? You use an Apple Watch or just use our phone or whatever. It's funny, you have nice wrist watches, but no, hardly anybody does the old pocket watch with a chain on it, you know. But he always had this pocket. He took his pocket watch off and he gave it to me as a gift. He says, I'm proud of you, boy. You're doing a good job. Just take this and give it to your kids someday, right? In fact, my son Elijah wore it to prom just a few weeks ago, right? So, and he still got it, I think. Anyway, but... That was a sweet moment that I will never forget with my grandfather, with my pet Paul. Now, wasn't he always my pet Paul? Sure. Did he always love me? Absolutely. But that was just a, a really powerful moment in fellowship with my pet Paul. That's kind of what the Lord's Supper is. Jesus is always with us, right? He's always our Lord. He's in us. When we come together at the Lord's Supper, it's that, it's that high point. It's just that sweet tender moment with our Lord and our Savior. And that's what we understand the view to be. It, yes, it's symbolic. But we participate in the sweetness of that moment, which leads us to number four. I'll go, go quickly through this. Examine. Verse 28 gets pretty stern here. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Or anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. So when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. Examination. So here, Paul gives us very serious warnings here. The word he uses here literally is the word unworthily, right? I don't know if that's a true word or not. I'm making it up. Maybe not. But since Christ is with us in a special way, the stakes are a little higher 
right? So the demand to come into his presence with the right attitude is also a little higher because coming to his presence in an unworthy manner or unworthily can bring God's discipline and judgment. So what does this word mean, unworthily? Well, it's an adverb, it's not an adjective. So here, he's not saying, don't come if you're unworthy, because how many of us are worthy in of ourselves to come to the table of the Lord? None of us. So it's not talking about us. It's talking about unworthily is an adverb, meaning the manner in which we come. How we come to the Lord's table is what he's talking about here, right? Because again, it's not about our worth. Jesus is worthy for us. But it's the manner of how we come is what Paul is getting at here. He's describing that, the how. So just a few thoughts. So A, examine your manner. How are you coming? Are you coming to the table self-righteously? Like, oh yeah, I deserve this. I've been doing great. Probably not. Are you coming flippantly? Like, oh, it's just something we do. That's why, we, that's why in our rhythms, we don't do it every week. We don't, we don't wanna become flippant about the Lord's Supper. Like, oh, it's just something we do. So, Sweet moment, right? This next one's be hard, defiantly. Here, I don't mean you're just, if you're just struggling with sin, all of us do that. Or if you're overwhelmed by some sin and temptation, all of us can be there. But when you are openly, intentionally, defiantly living in a lifestyle, living in a manner that is openly against God's word, and you know it does not honor the Lord, does not honor Jesus. In fact, it's a very kind of lifestyle that puts him on the cross. That's defiantly. J.D. Greer says it like this, is in taking the bread and cup, you're saying, thank God for Jesus and his death. It's my life and my hope. But then with your life, you're openly crucifying him. With your mouth, you're celebrating his cross while practicing the lifestyle that put him there. You cannot shout, worship him and crucify him at the same time and not expect God's judgment. So if you know that there's an area of your life where you are absolutely refusing to submit to the Lord in, do not touch this. It's too dangerous for you. I mean, listen what what Paul says, just to read it again. That's why many of you are weak, ill. Some have died. Now, it doesn't always happen. There's been plenty of people throughout history that have taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthily manner, right? And have gone on. But there's some who haven't. In fact, there'll be a examine the consequences. So what happens if you disregard the body? What happens if you disregard the Lordship of Christ? What happens if you eat from this table unworthily? We see this judgment. Theologian D.A. Carson, he tells the story of a pastor friend who had a church of about 200 people and the church was full of sin. I mean, deacons were committing adultery and it was just horrible, right? And no, none of the leaders would step up and hold anyone accountable. Well, the pastor just started praying, prayed for about three months. Lord, either, either take me to another church or just bring revival, do something powerful here for your people to be on fire for you. Church of 200. The next nine months, there were 34 funerals. Almost 20% of that church died that year. Then the next year, they baptized 200. Wow, what happened? God got busy. This is no joke. This isn't pie in the sky, by and by. This is, this is real. I mean, guess God loves us but we don't mess with God. God's holy, he's righteous, he's just, and he takes it seriously when we come together. So again, let me iterate. I'm not talking about if you're just battling sin, if you're just having temptations and you're struggling, you're overwhelmed. I'm not talking about that. All, that happens to all of us. You're still welcome at the table. We're forgiven. We're the family of the forgiven. But if you're defiantly going in another direction. If you're finally saying, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna, I know what God says, but I'm not gonna obey that. I'm in, having too much fun, or this is just who I am, or whatever, right? Don't, don't touch it. Cause, let a man examine himself. Because number two, when we come to the other at the Lord's table, it's about joy in the gospel. This is supposed to be a moment of incredible gospel clarity. 
where the church puts on visible display the unity, the love of Jesus, the love we have for each other. This is a sweet time for us as a family of God to participate in the Lord's Supper together where we declare our common hope. Yes, I may be poor, which most of us aren't in America, right? Another side note, I'm gonna go down. But if you're sick, we're not gonna be sick forever. If we've lost loved ones, we're not, we're not gonna be separated forever. We have this common hope in King Jesus who loves us, who saves us, who rescues us, who fills us, who empowers us, and gives us joy unspeakable. It's a time of togetherness where we feel the warmth of family. It's a time of personal worship and awe as we honor the one who saved us. So we get ready for the Lord's Supper. We're first gonna have a time of response because if there's any repentance that you need to do, we wanna open up the altar for that. If there's anyone here who's never trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, we wanna open up a moment for that to take place. So we're gonna give you a time to respond before we go into the Lord's Supper. Let's all stand. Let me pray for you. And we'll go into this time of response together. Father, we're in all of you. How much you love us, how kind and gracious you are with us, how according to scripture you are slow to anger, slow to wrath, but you are quick to mercy. But God, we also recognize that you are just and you're not to be trifled with. You are almighty, you're all powerful. And Lord, you talk about there's the the fear of the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom, this awe, this reverence. God, we see that here in this passage in the stern warning that that you give us through Paul about examining ourselves. So God, we just wanna, before we come to your table, we wanna spend just a few moments, Lord, just letting you examine us, examining ourselves, because we don't wanna come to this Lord's Supper with self-righteousness. We don't wanna come flippantly, God, we certainly don't want to come defiantly. And Lord, we do recognize that it's only for believers. So God, I just pray here, if there's anyone here in the room or watching online who's never trusted in you, Jesus, that in this moment, they would give their life to you, Jesus. They would confess you as Lord and they would find in their heart genuine faith that really trusts you and believes, Jesus, you died for them and you rose from the grave. So God, if if there's anyone here that needs to trust you as Lord and Savior, I I pray you would help them come forward and talk to one of our prayer counselors and begin an amazing journey. God, maybe there's some here who need to repent. Maybe they've been living defiantly, but God, right now you have been convicting them through your spirit. And Lord, you are calling them back and you're screaming in their mind, repent, come back to me, I love you. You're forgiven but this has got to stop. And Lord, they're ready. They're ready to repent. They're ready to humble themselves before you and begin to live life your way. So God, help them to come forward and just be with you, spend this time praying to you. God, maybe there's others here who have other things to repent of. Maybe there's um, some relationship problems. They just wanna ask your forgiveness before we come to the Lord's table. God, we don't wanna come before you in an unworthy manner, so help us do this appropriately. God, if others just need to pray for loved ones, God, maybe some need to join this church family in these next few moments. God, whatever those next decisions are, we pray that you would lead us and guide us for your glory's sake, in Christ's name, amen.